We are still on uh, the final month of our emphasis on equip. That we are to equip to serve the Lord. Right? We need to be equipped with knowledge, the head, the heart. Right? We must have a passion to serve God as well as the hand equipped with a skill as well. So as we serve the Lord, not only we need to have the heart to serve Him, it is also important for us to know our spiritual gifts and serve according to the gifts that God has given to us. And most importantly, we need to serve under the anointing and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, I would entitle my message this morning as Spirit Empowered Ministry. Spirit Empowered Ministry. In the book of Acts chapter 6, you, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 6. It tells us that during that time, the early church grew. The early church grew and it grew so large and so big that somehow right, there are needs, not only spiritual needs, but also physical needs as well. So it was necessary to select some people to help in the distribution of fruit so that they will free the apostles. To, con to concentrate on praying and to concentrate on the ministry of the Word of God. And so in the book of Acts, the Bible tells us that the disciples got together and they selected seven men right, to serve. And just now we have prayed for the church board members. They were also selected uh, to serve the Lord uh, in this manner. And so for these seven men, the Bible tells us that one of the criteria for them to be selected is that they must be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. According to Acts chapter 6, verse 3, they must be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Now, these are not the apostles. They were not part of the apostolic band. Uh, they were not part of the original disciples of Jesus. But at the same time, you know, they carried the anointing of God. The anointing of God was still upon them. And their initial ministry, you can say, they were to be the assistants to the apostle. So that the apostle do not need to do the work of the food distribution, but concentrate on preaching, concentrate on praying. But it is their role then, these seven people that were chosen to serve tables, to distribute food, to freeze up the apostle to do what God has called them to do. But yet, God sees that their role is so important, even though they were serving as assistant, that they need to be full of the Holy Spirit. They need to be full of the anointing of God. And of course, there were seven people. We won't have time to look into them if the Bible did not focus on the rest, but focus on two individuals. And this is what we want to look at, these two individuals that the Bible focused on. Right? And these two individuals, now first of all, you have Stephen. Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. That was what described him. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And then the second person uh, that the Bible emphasized, the book of Acts emphasized, was Philip. Philip, who was also a man full of the Holy Spirit, and not only that, he was very sensitive to God. He was very sensitive to his voice. And these two men were empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they, when they serve, they serve with great impact. And no, notice that today, the same anointing is also upon us, all of us. The Holy Spirit is upon us, anointing is upon us, because the same Holy Spirit that's working through them is the same Holy Spirit that's working through us as well. The same Holy Spirit that indwell them is the same Holy Spirit that indwell us. The same Holy Spirit that baptized them is the same Holy Spirit that baptized us. And even Jesus himself, before he launched into his public ministry, Jesus needed to be full of the Holy Spirit and he was anointed by the Spirit. So in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and verse 19, this is how it was described about Jesus. He, uh, Jesus was reading from the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue and he read the word, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So even Jesus himself was anointed by the Holy Spirit when he went about preaching and when he went about doing good. 
So the anointing basically has to do with the Holy Spirit that is empowering us. What does it mean then to be full of the Holy Spirit? We read this phrase, you know, full of the Holy Spirit or filled with the Spirit very often, especially in the book of Acts. To be full of the Holy Spirit is not something mystical. Uh, it's not something mystical. It is not something that's hyper-spiritual. Uh, it does not mean that we need to speak in tongues 24-7. Yes, we are, when we are filled with the Spirit, we speak in tongues. We should speak in tongues every day in our own devotion. But that does not mean we speak in tongues all the day long. Uh, it does not mean we must have certain aesthetic experience, always seeing vision, always seeing angels, always having some physical you know, expression, you know, always dreaming dream. No, that does not mean that we are full of the Spirit. But full of the Spirit simply means we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are conscious of the presence of God. We are very conscious of the presence of God in our life. It means we communicate with God, we communicate with the Holy Spirit and we are totally dependent on Him all the time. It also means we walk in obedience to God and we let the Holy Spirit take full control of our life. In other words, we let the Holy Spirit take over us. To be full of the Spirit is that we surrender to the Holy Spirit and we let the Holy Spirit take over us. So as we look into the life of these two men, we, re we can really see the effects of God's anointing in their life and their ministry. And they were greatly empowered by God, anointed by the Spirit of God. In, um, first of all, let's see how the Scripture uh, describes Stephen, what Stephen did. In Acts chapter 6, all right, Acts chapter 6, and verse 8 to verse 10. All right, let me just read to you, Acts chapter 6, verse 8 to 10. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Oppositions arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the free men, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. So this was Stephen's ministry, powerful, all right? And the people could not stand against the wisdom that God has given to him. The next person is Philip. I turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 4 to verse 8, and see what happened to Philip and what did he do? Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 4, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the sign he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with strict impure spirit came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was given... There, so there was great joy in that city. So when you look at the description of these two men, we learn that first of all, the spirit and power ministry resulted in the miraculous. The spirit and power ministry resulted in the miraculous. And the Holy Spirit used both Stephen and Philip to perform signs and wonders. Now, these two, as I mentioned, they were not part of the apostles. You can say in today's term, they were the laymen. They were the lay people, they were the laymen. They were chosen to serve table, chosen to distribute food. Right? Yet they were greatly used by God because they were full of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, every one of us here, and those of you who are sitting down there, you can be full of the Spirit. It's not just, you know, specially reserved for a special, uh, a special category of clergy or pastor or evangelist or preacher, but all of us can be full of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Right? Believe it and you can receive it as you walk, walk close to the Lord. And therefore, you realize that miracles still happen today. When God people dare to believe, when God people dare to trust, and when God people dare to act and step out in faith for Him. So when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we should not be afraid to ask. We should not be afraid to pray. And we should not be afraid to expect the miraculous to happen. You agree? Right? We must be bold enough to ask God even for the miraculous. Now, how many of us here have witnessed miracles happen before? You have witnessed me your own eye. Don't be shy. Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. 
See, someone, raise, raise your hand, raise your hand. Yeah. When you see the many hands raised, it is an encouragement to all of us that God still do miracles today. God still do miracles today. It is possible. And as you have seen miracles happen before your eye before, now let me ask the next question. How many of you have personally experienced miracles of God in your life? Raise your hand. You personally? Fantastic. All right? And of course, I don't have time to ask all of you what kind of miracles that God has done for you. I believe miracles are a plenty. But we must not limit miracles to just healing that we can see physically, like you know, the lame walk, you know, the blind see, you know, the, the, the mute speak. We are not just referring to this spectacular miracle, the miracle of healing, that we have seen, we have witnessed when we go for healing rally, evangelistic rally. Yeah, these are some of the spectacular miracles that God can work. And God has, you know, given this spiritual gift to some people, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, that they are able to perform all these things. But when we talk about the miraculous, it can also uh, refer to some seemingly difficult or even impossible situation that have been turned around. When, when I ask you, you know, if you have experienced miracle, many of you raise your hand. And, and I think that not all miracles are related to healing, am I right? Yeah, it could be something else. It could be in your job, you know, that tough situation, and you find that it's an impossible situation, and yet you pray that God just turned the situation around. It could be a family issue that seems so impossible to, to solve, and God stepped into the family and bring healing and turn the situation around. That itself can be a miracle. Uh, it can be many, uh, a, a tough situation that we face with. I uh, say, you know, at anything that is extraordinary can be a form of the miracle for us as well. Now, when you pray for impossible situation to turn around, and it did, it's a miracle. When, when you're broke, you got no more money, and you pray for finance, and God provided through extraordinary way, that's a miracle. And when you knew that you did very poorly for your exam, you, you, you actually you know, didn't answer some of the questions. And you were praying hard, oh, uh, God, if I just get a pass, I'll be happy. But you got an A. To you, it's a miracle, isn't it? Right? I know SPM result is out. Uh, so far, I do not know how, how good you are. But I believe right, SJAG students are A class one, always good one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you all do very well. Okay. And um, what else? A miracle, you know, can be that you go and apply for a dream job. But you saw hundreds of people also apply and they were more qualified than you. And then your heart sank. Ah, there goes my dream job. But miraculously, they offer you one that is less qualified and less experienced. But they offer the job to you, to you. It's a miracle. Don't you think so? I saw miracle are a plenty. I saw miracle. There are so many, many different ways. What is miracle to you? Other people may not see it because they don't see it physically. But we all know that it is the miraculous. So what I'm trying to say is that when we serve under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, expect the miraculous. When we pray for the sick, believe. Believe that they will be healed. When we serve the Lord, we will encounter lots of problems. When we talk about serving God, even in the church, we will encounter obstacles. Some problems we can solve uh, by experience, by our skill, but some problems are beyond us. That's why it's so important for us not to serve in the flesh, but to serve in the spirit. Now, when you're faced with a task that's too big for you, when you rely on the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, it will be done. It will be done because we are not serving with the flesh, all right? So when you serve, serve with faith and the result will surprise you and I believe it goes to all different types of ministry. It is not only certain ministry that you need the anointing, certain ministry that you don't. No. All the ministry that we serve, we need the enablement of the Holy Spirit, whether you are serving the children, the youth, the senior adults, you know, whether you are the ushers, people ministry, you know, the ushers, the greeters, or the traffic wardens, or whether you are in the technical ministry in terms of media, the sound, and so on and so forth, and even seemingly mundane tasks like being the librarian, the SNS. Every ministry can be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You may ask, what anointing do I need? 
to serve as a traffic warden. Have you ever thought of that? What anointing do I need to serve as traffic warden? You know, traffic warden is a thankless job. Uh, that's why it's very hard to get people to want to serve. Many people do not know how to appreciate the traffic warden, but I appreciate all the traffic wardens. Can we give all the traffic wardens a hand? They work hard throughout. Right? They work hard. And of course, you know, by, by grace of God, you can call them to them. You know, I, I, they got their break during the MCO. <laughs> they got the time to break, and now they are back serving God. I right? say, hey, I'm a traffic warden. Do I need the anointing? You know, why do I need to uh, be empowered? Does it mean that God will endure me with supernatural strength like Samson so that when there is traffic congestion, a congestion car are blocking the way, I can just lift up the car and then let the rest pass through and put the car down empowered by the Spirit. Is that what it means? How nice if traffic warden, you have the kind of supernatural strength to just lift up car and clear the traffic, isn't it? But that's not what it means, right? You need to be spirit empowered to deal with some tough situation too. Because we know that it's not easy being a traffic warden, it can be tough. Uh, like uncooperative members, you need patience, you need gentleness, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You need wisdom to even, you know, uh, uh, handle some unreasonable demands and yet keep your cool and keep your sanctification. <laughs> Am I right? I, I know those of you who are traffic warden, you know what I'm talking about. But when the Holy Spirit is upon you, you will be able to handle those situations, yet able to serve with the joy of the Lord. And the same goes with all kinds of ministry. A spirit and power usher can give a prophetic word to a visitor. Or an encouraging greeter can pray for the visitor with the anointing of God or speak to the heart of those that come. You know? And a spirit and enabled librarian can recommend the right book to the person who needs to read it most at that point in his life or in her life. So all those who are serving, do not serve merely out of a sense of duty, but serve under the unction of God the Holy Spirit. Every ministry is important. Every ministry is valuable. And God also appreciates all your faithful service. And secondly, the Spirit and power ministry resulted in wisdom. Not only it resulted in the miraculous, it resulted in wisdom because just now we read chapter uh, 6 verse 10, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. The wisdom that Stephen had. Now, there were a lot of learned members of the synagogue during that time. They were the religious leaders. They were the scholars. But they could not win a theological argument with Stephen, a commoner. A layman. They couldn't win the argument. Right? It's not easy to argue and convince the theological elites. But Stephen's argument was not based on man's persuasion. But it was based on God's wisdom. It was God's wisdom upon him that he was able to speak the word of God. The wisdom that Stephen exhibited could not be earned through his theological background or education. Just like when Jesus was a child, Jesus was able to debate with the religious leader because he was full of divine wisdom. We need lots of wisdom in serving God too. And since the day one that I started serving in this church, Asking God for wisdom has been my number one prayer point. It has been my number one prayer point, asking God for wisdom. And as I look back, there were many tricky situations I find myself in. There were tough decisions I needed to make at, in the course of my responsibility. And I asked God for wisdom. And many times God gave wisdom to make the right decision in many occasions. And when I was younger, I asked God to give me wisdom beyond my age. But when I grow older, I ask God to give me wisdom beyond my experience. And at all times, I ask God for His divine wisdom. And all of us need to pray that prayer. And I learned that prayer from Solomon when Solomon was first you know, called and anointed to be king over Israel. That was the prayer that he made. And I follow after Solomon and seeking and praying for God's wisdom as we carry out our responsibility. When God takes over, the effect and the impact is going to be different. There are times you need to make decisions, right decision and good decision, or even tough decision. 
Now, a good decision or a right decision may not be a popularist decision. You know what it means. Sometimes, you know, the political master, they want to make popular decisions that make people happy. But you and I know some decisions are actually not good decisions. People may be happy about it, but in the long run, it may not be good. And therefore, we need God's wisdom, not making popularist decisions to make everybody happy, but make good and right decisions that's according to the will of God for the good of the ministry, even as we serve the Lord. Pray for wisdom in every area that you are serving, in every decision that you are making. When we are empowered by the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit, it will result in wisdom of God. And thirdly, the Spirit Empowered Ministry resulted in anointed preaching. It resulted in anointed preaching. Now, both Stephen and Philip proclaimed the message of Christ. They, when they proclaim it, they proclaim it with great effectiveness. They were convincing. And the message pricked the heart, pricked the conscience of the hearers. Unfortunately, in Stephen's case, right, it led to greater opposition, not because it was not convincing, but because the message was so anointed that those who were convicted refused to accept it. They were actually resisting the working of God. And because of that, they opposed Stephen all the more and refused to accept the truth. Stephen became the first Christian martyr. But on the other hand, in Philip's case, that anointed preaching brought about a great harvest of souls, brought about a great revival in the region of Samaria. So many people came to know God. And these Samaritans, they were not pure Jews. Uh, they were intermarried. But yet the grace of God was upon them. And, you know, even as Jesus has commanded us to go and preach the gospel and make disciples, the proclamation of the word is fundamental in serving God. And when we proclaim the word of God, believe that the anointing of God is upon us. So it resulted with anointed preaching. Now, we may not preach like a good evangelist, but we all still can share the gospel effectively with the help of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about preaching, a lot of us, you know, a lot of you that sit down there, you say, I don't preach. Yeah, you don't have to preach, but you can share, right? We prefer to use a more comfort, uh, comfortable word. I share, la, you know, I, I share my testimony. Good, great. Your testimony is powerful. I can share the gospel. I can share Christ. Good. You don't want to preach, never mind. You share. Whether you call it preaching, whether you call it sharing, what is important is a proclamation of the word of God. It's a proclamation of the gospel. It doesn't matter in what form it comes in. It is still the proclamation of the word. It's a proclamation of the gospel. And we need the anointing of God. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8, a very familiar verse that Jesus had already promised. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the same Holy Spirit is upon you Folks in SJAG, uh, that you can be witnesses of God in Subang Jaya, what else? In Klang Valley, in Selangor, in the whole of Malaysia, and to the uttermost part of the world, you see? Therefore, we must ask for the Holy Spirit to help us when we share our faith. Do not worry what to say. A lot of times people are worried. I don't know what to say, you know. That's a problem because we try to think of what to say. We worry too much. But when you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, Jesus told the disciples, don't worry what to say. The Holy Spirit will put words in our mouth. The Holy Spirit will help us. He will give us wisdom to say the right thing because every situation is different. Everyone you share Christ with, their personal situation are different. So therefore, you can share the gospel differently and the Holy Spirit will help you to do that. Yes, I believe we need to be equipped. It is good to be equipped. It's good to know some technique, some pointers in presenting the gospel. Like we talk about the bridge approach, you know, and we talk about the different, different methodology that we can use, or even one-minute evangelism. Yes, we can learn all these skills and tools. They are very helpful. You should be equipped on it. 
But at the same time, we don't have to over rely on it because there are times when you share the gospel, you don't need any of this. There are times you don't even need to refer them because the situations are different. But when the Holy Spirit is upon you, you will be able to say the right thing. Oftentimes, the opportunity comes to us unexpectedly. You don't have time to prepare. You don't have time to prepare. A lot of times, in the course of conversation, it's a course of friendship. And the subject matter bring up, and you just need to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us to bring the message across. In the same way, lifestyle leaders, teachers, whether you are teaching the children or the youth, and facilitators for the cell as well. Uh, whenever you lead, whenever you teach, be assured that when you do so, do so under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and it will be effective. When you don't feel adequate, a lot of time I don't feel adequate too, but the Word of God is still powerful. The Word of God is not depend on you, but the Word of God is still effective in spite of you. The Word of God is still powerful in spite of me, a weak vessel. And the Bible says that this mystery of God, uh, the gospel of reconciliation, is being put in jars of clay. Jars of clay is so brittle. Jars of clay is so vulnerable. Jars of clay can be very unsightly. But the power of the word, the power of the message is it on this jar. So it's not because of us, how great we are, how clever we are, but in spite of us. So this is where we can see the power of God manifested, the anointing of God manifested through our life, and the Word of God can go forth effectively. And you may ask, how do I know? How do I know that I am empowered by the Spirit? That will have to depend on your relationship with God. Right? Are you depending on Him, or are you depending on on yourself and you serve. And for those of you who serve God long enough, you will be able to experience the difference. There are times when you serve out of the flesh. You know that you just get a job done. And that's it. You don't have the sense of satisfaction and you don't see the impact. But there were times when you feel that you're so weak, you feel that you can't do it. When you rely on the Holy Spirit, you see the result is different. Hey, how come this time I feel so inadequate but yet the result turned out different because you operate not in the flesh. You operate under the anointing of God. So therefore, serve the Lord under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And finally, what do you mean by Spirit-empowered? I've been talking about Spirit-empowered ministry. What do you mean by Spirit-empowered? To put it very simply, to be Spirit-empowered is to be led by the Spirit. It will be led by the Spirit. And we have a good example here uh, by Philip. Philip was obedient and sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And let's continue to read about Philip in Acts chapter 8. And I'm going to read to you from verse 26 to verse 30. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, so he, so he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candace, which means queen of the Ethiopian. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah through the prophet. Verse 29, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. Philip was having a very successful ministry, which I have read to you just now, that there was a great revival in Samaria, which he was a key person that God used. But yet, Philip was not the one who drew attention to himself. Some people, when they serve God, they want to draw attention to themselves. When they serve God, they want the spotlight to be on them. That's not the way we serve God. Right? The spotlight shouldn't be on any one of us, but it should be on God himself. And so, you know, Philip did not want to hog the lamb, right? When the Spirit of God asked him to go to a desert road, to live a very powerful and effective ministry, to go to the desert road without telling him what he will see. But what did Philip do? He obeyed. 
He obeyed the angel of the Lord. It's a message of God. So a person that's living under the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be obedient to the voice of God. So he obeyed. And therefore, it was along the road, he met, yes, you can say, uh, a group of people, entourage, but the key person was that it was an Ethiopian eunuch. And there, while he was there, right, you realize that a man of the Spirit is very conscious of the Holy Spirit. First of all, he was conscious when God sent the angel to speak to him. And then now when he met the eunuch, which is a high-ranking officer, it was the spirit that told Philip, not the angel. The Bible says the spirit told Philip to go to the chariot and stay near it. How did the spirit speak to Philip? In his heart. Speak to him. And Philip heard it because he was a man full of the spirit. And because he was full of the Spirit, he was sensitive. He was sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And when he took the first step in responding to the Spirit, his subsequent action was totally his own as one who is empowered by the Spirit. In other words, when the Holy Spirit asked him to stay near to the chariot, the Holy Spirit do not need to detect to him what to do. Okay, Philip. Now you stay near to the, to the chariot. Okay, I want you to count one to ten. Now next, you're going to ask the Ethiopian, uh, you're going to ask the Yunnan, what are you reading? Next, no, the Holy Spirit don't have to detect to Philip what to do. God gave us the free will. God gave us wisdom, right? And God gave us a brain to think. And God empowers with the Spirit. And when Philip took the first step of faith in responding to the voice of the Spirit. Subsequently, his subsequent action was totally led by the Spirit. He don't have to wait for the voice anymore. He just say what he need to say. Right? And, and, and he, he knew you know, what he need to do. When he saw this man reading Isaiah, naturally he asked, do you understand what you read when the guy said no? And there Philip got the opportunity to be invited up the chariot and begin to share Christ with the person and say that what you read is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And as a result, the Ethiopian eunuch was saved and he was baptized and Philip really had the wisdom of God to do the right thing. So church, to be led by the Spirit, you don't have to everything ask God for. You don't have to be in early in the morning, open up your wardrobe and say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. What kind of shirt should I wear today? That's not being led by the Spirit. That is overdoing it, overstretching it. All right? You don't have to ask the Holy Spirit for lunch. What shall I order? Chicken rice, chafan, or bakute. You don't have to do this. This is not led by the Spirit. To me, sometimes this is foolishness. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Okay? Because when you walk in step with the Spirit, you are conscious of Him. Yeah? You, you let the Holy Spirit lead you in your daily affair, but... You don't have to ask the Holy Spirit every detail of your life, okay? So the amazing thing was, the, after the eunuch was baptized, Philip experienced the supernatural. The supernatural, he was transported from one place to another. When I read this, right, it was so amazed. I was so amazed with it. Because in verse 39, what does it say? When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all towns until he reached Caesarea. Wow! He just disappeared. Pop! And then he landed in another place, Azotus. And Azotus was about 28 km from where he was from Gaza. And there, Philip continued preaching. It, it was no long. The Bible did not tell us that the Spirit tell Philip what to do anymore. But because Philip was sensitive to the Holy Spirit, he knew God has called him to preach the gospel. So along the coastal road, as he, he went all the way up to this area, at every station, every town, he just went about preaching the gospel. I thought walking on water was tough and impossible. But now being transported from one place to another without any mode of transport, if that is not miracle, what is it? It's even more spectacular, isn't it? I wish I can be transported like that all the time so I don't have to drive, I don't have to go through the traffic jam, save petrol, save money and eco-friendly, isn't it? 
Well, don't worry, we'll, we'll be like that one day. During the rapture, when we are caught up in the air, we will be transported just like that. So if that can happen to Philip, we know that rapture is possible. Amen? Uh, it's possible that we can be transported supernaturally. All right? So my point is that, that we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we must learn to hear His voice. Not hearing ourselves speaking back to ourselves. Don't mistake our own mind. Don't mistake our own thought to be that of the Holy Spirit. Because whenever the Holy Spirit speaks, the Holy Spirit will lead us to do the will of God. And the Holy Spirit, whatever He speaks to us, will be in line with the Word of God. Alright, so that will be a good test. Philip was humble even though he experienced the supernatural. He did not boast of his supernatural transportation. He humbly continued to preach the word. So church, all of us, all of us need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. All of us need to activate the gift of the Holy Spirit that is in us. And I encourage all of us to rise up, to rise up to start serving God. Do not give any more excuses. Do not feel inadequate. Start serving God and you will be surprised to see how God can work through you. When God empowered you, when the anointing of the Lord is upon you, yes, you can do great things for God. Above and beyond your own imagination, you can do it not because of you, because of God and because of the Holy Spirit that is upon you. Amen? Amen.